The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anuj Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals helping to shape it. Today, I've got Dr. Matt Brown on the show. Matt is an award-winning pain consultant specializing in pain medicine and anesthetics, and he recently published some research into using cannabinoids for cancer pain treatment. He's here today to talk about the broader topic of pain and how cannabis may be able to help with that. Welcome, Matt. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. So there's lots to talk about and pain is something that sadly most people have to deal with at some point in their lives. But before we get into that, it'd be good to maybe just talk a bit about your backstory and how you came from being a doctor to studying cannabis. Yeah, so um, I'm a consultant in pain medicine here in London and I do pain research. And during my training, I was lucky enough to work in several laboratories that had taken a very early interest in Um, the presence of cannabinoid receptors in the central nervous system. And that really um, spiked my interest in the subject. The work that I do now clinically, a lot of patients that I encounter professionally are using cannabis to self-medicate for their symptoms. And, And the combination of my academic interest and contact with it in the past, and the fact that lots and lots of my patients are very interested in this subject due to all of the media interest that has driven my um, direction of travel towards this this area. It's fascinating that you've kind of responded to the the needs of the patients. I guess there's some people in your profession who are maybe a bit resistant as well. Yeah, I think that as a doctor, your primary concern is patient well-being and and safety. I mean, ensuring that your patients are listened to and their concerns addressed. And one of the biggest uses of cannabis is to manage pain. And we know that patients are illicitly sourcing medical cannabis and other cannabis related products to treat their pain. And, you know, I feel that it's a responsibility of of a doctor to ensure that patient safety is is, is safeguarded and investigated and protected by, by their clinicians. And that's why I have an interest in this area. I also think, however, that a lot of the approaches from the the medical establishment and and rural colleges are are, are very sensible. We we don't understand this area very well. um, And if we are concerned about patient safety, then appropriate research and measuring of adverse events and side effects is is completely warranted Mm -hmm. and understandable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think there needs to be proportionality on both sides in how we approach it. Cool. Okay. Well, this is a big, big topic. Um, Maybe we start at the very beginning and just maybe you can just explain to the audience what exactly pain is. Yeah. So we all, we all sort of know what pain is, don't we? You know, you stub your toe, you hit your thumb with a hammer and you get pain, but actually there's a slightly more in-depth definition of pain that's published by the International Association for the Study of Pain. And that basically defines pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. So when you think about that, the pain isn't just that physical process of hitting your thumb with a hammer and, and going ouch and you know, pulling your thumb away. That's very useful. That serves a biological purpose. It protects you as an organism. But pain also encompasses the, the emotional distress if you've had back pain for six months and you're not working and you're worrying about your future and it's affecting your mood, that also forms part of the, the pain process. Mm. And the way we look at pain is we look at it through a biopsychosocial model. So the idea that having pain impacts your, your social life, it often impacts your psychological well-being as well. So pain is a far more complex subject than just a simple sensory process. Mm. And that makes it very hard to treat it makes it very common and it makes it very distressing for our patients as well and 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 to dig into that biopsychosocial is a new word to me but is that a new word to the medical community as well was research into pain previously mainly focused on that physical element when you look at pain in general the idea of no susceptive pain so that that sort of pathway from a unpleasant event 
So hitting your thumb with a hammer, the signals going up the nerve to your brain where it's processed and you, you feel the pain. There's been an awful lot of research on that since you know, the turn of the 19th century, the basic physiological research. The concept of a biopsychosocial model is more modern. That's from the sort of 1960s and 70s. Mm. But it's certainly something that in pain medicine and pain specialists across the world are very familiar with. And you can look at a biopsychosocial model for most chronic disease, obesity, diabetes. They all have ramifications beyond the disease state themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that all makes sense. Yeah. And I'm glad there's an appreciation of it. I have a friend that had very severe back pain for quite some time. Yep. Yeah, it, it obviously got him down. He wasn't able to work. And yeah. and that was a significant part of the, the issue. Yep. Before we kind of move on to the next bit, I think I heard you on another podcast talking about the purpose of pain. And, and would you mind explaining about that in terms yeah. of anthropologically yep. why it's useful? So pain is evolutionarily beneficial. So if you are living in a cave hunting woolly mammoth and you break your ankle, pain tells you not to wait there through that ankle until it's healed. And that kind of pain is, we call it acute pain, so it's short-lived and it's nociceptive pain. So it's, it's a sense like any other sense, hearing, smell, serves a biological purpose. If you don't have that sense and some people are born with the inability to sense pain, you then have a very, very difficult life because you don't know that you're hurting yourself and it's, it's life-threatening, mm. essentially. What we're also interested in in the specialty of pain medicine is, is longer-lasting pain, and we, we call that chronic pain. Mm. So characteristically, it's pain that lasts longer than three months. It often is due to damage to the nervous system itself. So you're getting aberrant signaling in the nervous system. We call that neuropathic pain. And that doesn't serve a biological purpose because it's due to a malfunction of the nervous system. It's difficult to understand for patients. It's difficult to manage because it doesn't respond to lots of simple painkillers like paracetamol or ibuprofen. And it's very, very common. And it places a huge burden both on our patients and society, but also on healthcare systems. Because as your friend probably discovered, he'd, with his back pain, probably see a number of different specialists utilize quite a lot of healthcare resource essentially for a condition that is difficult to diagnose difficult to manage and it, it's a it's a huge challenge and there's a huge amount of unmet need in that population yeah I, I, the word neuro does that mean brain or is that nerves nerves yeah nerves. so okay. the brain is essentially a big bundle of nerves right, right. So, and you've got the central nervous system so you've got the brain and the spinal cord which is where all the information comes in from the periphery. In the periphery, you've got the peripheral nervous system. So you've got millions and millions and millions of tiny nerve endings all over your skin, all over your joints. Um, and for example, if you've got diabetes, some of those nerves can die back and become very painful. Mm. The same with chemotherapy, which is one of my big interests. Chemotherapy damages those nerves. You end up with very unpleasant symptoms mm. like pain, but also things like pins and needles, mm. which if you go back to the proper definition of pain because it's an unpleasant sensory symptom is actually pain yeah um, and if you think about it if you had pins and needles all the time horrible yeah very you know upsetting and distressing yeah definitely thank you for that it's a really good explanation of of, of what pain is because I'm, I'm sure people yeah have an understanding of it but probably don't yeah. a real overview and just how big a problem is it in the uk in terms of you know the things yeah. that you see in terms of patients so because pain is so complex and it's quite hard to actually define, the, the rates of pain vary depending on which studies you read. But the bottom line is it's really, really common. The rates range from about 20 to 40 percent of the population have experienced chronic pain at some point in, the, in their life. So if you think about it, it's hugely common. It has a huge impact on the economy of the UK. Think about the numbers of days of work lost due to pain, back pain other musculoskeletal pain. If you think about the kind of conditions that are associated with pain, they're often degenerative conditions that are more common in, in an aging population. We've got an aging population. Mm -hmm. So actually the burden of pain in our society is going to increase. And you look at things like cancer survivorship. So we're, we're doing better and better at how we manage cancer. We're turning it more into a chronic condition in, in certain tumor types. And often those patients will have a burden of pain or you know, unpleasant sensory disturbance. 
So it's, it's very common. It's recognised by the UK government, the Department of Health, as being a huge priority area mm. because it uses up so much resource and it has a huge impact on society. And it's very difficult to treat. So the way in which pain is managed at the moment is relatively suboptimal. Mm. We don't manage pain in a lot of patients particularly well. That's because it's difficult to measure, it's difficult to understand, it's mm. difficult to explain to patients. Mm. And the number of pain specialists in the UK is relatively small. Really? Um, so yeah, it's pain medicine's a relatively new specialty and a lot of anaesthetic trainees in the UK aren't interested in going to pain medicine. So it's a, it's a very small specialty. Wow, that's mm. interesting. Yep. Because I mean, I would say that in the public realm, the idea of pain is talked about quite a lot, yeah. I think. Well, and, think. And maybe that's to do... Sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, you think about pain in society um, and pain as a, you know, an artistic metaphor, suffering. Um, it, it runs through lots of, lots of, you know, religious tales. It runs through art. It, it forms a huge kind of... Um, a huge influence on the way that society's developed over the millennia. But that's because it's so complex and because it intertwines with so many different areas of our life. If you talk to cancer patients, it's the most feared symptom. Mm. You know, I, I don't want to be in pain. If you talk to anyone you know, they'll all have experienced pain. And it's, it's a fascinating window into people's sort of psychological robustness because two people can have identical levels of pain, but it can impact on their functional levels massively in a massively different way, right? Yeah. And that, again, is, is a, a really interesting aspect of pain as a phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. I think you touched on something that I, it's a recurring theme in when I speak to people from scientific backgrounds yep. is the idea of personalised medicine is evolving at the same time as cannabis. Yep. It's becoming more sort of thought about yep. and this, this, this idea that things affect people in different ways, yep. which is actually what's happened with your standard pharmaceutical drugs for yep. a number of years. For example, my dad is allergic to penicillin, mm. whereas I'm not. You know, it, yep. these things uh, that happen to different people. I think, yeah, one of the one of the really interesting things about the the advent of cannabis-based medical products in the UK and the the development of medtech, um, the idea that using smart devices, wearable tech, AI, all of those can disrupt the way in which medicine's practiced because it gives you the ability to monitor people far more closely. It gives you the ability to be dynamic in the, the kind of endpoints that you look for when you're collecting data. The problem um, when you do pain research is that how do, you, how do you measure the effect of a drug? What do you look at? Do you look at a, a numerical rating scale? So has it reduced your pain by two points from eight to six? We know in pain patients that... Pain, is, that is that perceived? Yeah, so if you, if you try, how do you measure pain? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? And this is, these are the kind of big questions that pain medicine as a specialty struggles with because it's not like, for example, blood pressure where you can put on a blood pressure cuff, pump it up and get two numbers that you can you know, reliably reproduce. If you ask a patient about their pain, you can use different rating scales. So, you know, naught to 10, where 10 is the worst pain ever, naught is nothing. You know, put a mark on that scale. Problem is we know that patients in chronic pain, because it's a neurological phenomenon, it affects their numeracy. So lots of studies that actually your ability to, to understand numbers gets affected by being in pain. Yeah. Can you do imaging? Well, there's lots of work on functional MRI scans. The problem with that is that you have to put someone through an MRI scanner. Yeah. You have to have you know, a lab full of postdocs to work out all the algorithms. So it's not a simple thing to do. Mm. You can do biopsies, so you, can take, you can take a skin biopsy and you can count the nerve fibers. But again, some patients with low nerve fibers have no symptoms at all. So it's a real, it's a real mess. Yeah. And actually then what, what you do is you're, you're chucking in a intervention, so a drug or something, and you're trying to then see whether it's effective when you're measuring things that are very hard to measure yeah. without well-defined endpoints. Then therefore it's difficult to evaluate the effectiveness. Yeah. And then, and this is why a lot of studies that are done looking at medical cannabis products, one of the reasons that the outcomes are always underwhelming, to put it mildly, is that, you know, the endpoints are often confused. The endpoints often neglect the psychosocial aspects of pain. Mm. 
So if you're doing a simple numerical rating scale, naught's 10 for pain, but you're not looking at things like mood, functional levels, employment status, use of other pain medications, if, if, you're, if you're very narrow in your endpoints, you run the risk of not actually showing a benefit or demonstrating any benefit, even though it's there. Mm. And then the other problem is that if you then combine those studies, which have all got different endpoints and have got different interventions in the form of different cannabis-based medical products going in, it's very hard to draw a, a, a coherent conclusion because mm. you've got, you know, it's like, taking a fruit basket and saying they're all apples when in fact you've got a different a huge range of different fruits yeah yeah it's it, it, very difficult to really very difficult. difficult and very difficult to fit into the model that we've been used to working with for a number of years and query whether a new approach or a slightly more nuanced approach yeah. is needed and this way you go back to med tech you go back to that disruptor and what my feeling is that cannabis-based medical products are doing is they're driving that conversation because the the simple the RCT the kind of gold standard where you have a single chemical moiety that you've invented in a lab and you test in a very well defined double blinded randomized control trial model that's fine if you've invented a blood pressure tablet and you can do it in twenty thousand patients across multiple centres but medical cannabis and cannabis based medical products are a very different entity to that mm. and. Certainly the discussions are happening as to the best way in which these products can be investigated because they need to be investigated. And I think we, we owe it to our patients who at the moment are, and we know they're self-medicating with the stuff anyway, we owe it to our patients to come up with a responsible, robust and mature mechanism to actually look at these products um, in in the clinical environment. Yeah, let's... let's put it into an, an, uh, an acronym, C yep. CBMP, yep. Cannabis Based Based Medical, Medical Products, yep. right? Um, which might be, the, the acronym might be harder to say than the full yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 But um, what's the kind of historical background to, to this, mm. to these sort of... Well, it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, if you look at the cannabis plant and hemp as a, as a product, as a crop, it's been with us since, you know, the the early days of um, organized agriculture and, as, and society. And, you know, you go back to the sort of ancient um, Middle East and Near East that, you know, has been grown thousands and thousands of years ago. And when you think about the, the plants, it, it has a huge number of different uses from fibers through to animal feed, through to its use as a medical product. And, you know, you look at medical texts from ancient Egypt, from ancient Greece, from Rome, through ancient Arabia, it's always mentioned and used for a, a huge range of different applications, alongside lots of other herbs and you know, natural products. And it, it, it's played a role all the way through medical history in essentially relieving pain and other neurological conditions, um, anxiety, insomnia. If you look at um, Nicholas Culpepper, um, he, he wrote a treatise in the 16th century called The Complete Herbal, and that essentially describes a number of different herbal plants used in medicine in the UK, and hemp was one of them. It was on the British pharmacopoeia um, up until the 1930s, and because of the British Empire, there were a huge number of doctors that had been over in, in India, often military doctors, who, who got experience of using it as an analgesic. And if you think about... Um, what treatments we had in the 19th and early 20th century, it, you know, it was pretty rudimentary. We didn't have a huge number of options as far as analgesics were concerned. And what, what gradually happened was the, the advent of modern pharmaceutical um, production, um, drug development and design, um, essentially consigned medical cannabis to, you know, the dustbin, as it were, because the single chemical entities that we understand fully well understand relatively well were introduced they were able to demonstrate good effect and and medical cannabis fell out of favor but that obviously didn't stop patients and and individuals from from utilizing it and self-medicating with it on a pretty widespread basis mm. one of the most interesting patients treated with medical cannabis was queen victoria who was given it during childbirth for, for analgesic effects right um so it was um, it was not viewed as being in any way abnormal to mm. use 
tincture of hemp, for example, um, for for analgesic purposes. Really? Yeah. That, I mean, there's there's lots of stories about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. its prevalence in historical context. Yeah. But it, it, it's a hugely useful plant, and not just from from a medical viewpoint. When you look at its use for for production of fibres, it grows on very very poor soils. It produces a huge amount of highly nutritious, you know, edible seeds, and it it essentially got bundled up in in a huge amount of kind of political and legislative processes that you know. In another day, it could have been the opium poppy and opioids that got bundled up in yeah. that process, and we'd still be using cannabis and cannabis-based medical products. Yeah. And if, in fact, if we'd had 90, 100 years worth of pharmaceutical research on the endocannabinoid system and all of the phytochemicals in a cannabis plant, we may well be in a far more interesting position where we, we'd understand that much better than we do and also we'd be using a far more refined product that has better outcomes so mm. yeah it's it's really interesting when you do do that mind experiment and you know get to that end point it's, it's really interesting so yeah really interesting maybe we talk a bit about what's happening now yeah. then and, and what you're all kind of getting your, your hands dirty yeah. with so what happens in the uk was autumn last year there was a seismic change in the way that cannabis-based medical products are viewed and legislated. It was moved Schedule 1 to Schedule 2 as a drug, essentially saying that there is evidence for its use in, in certain medical conditions. A number of guidelines and guidance came out from NHS England essentially restricting the use of cannabis-based medical products to specialists, so essentially consultants, but also restricting its use to conditions where there's evidence for its benefit, where there's unmet need. So the patient has already tried a number of established treatments, licensed treatments, and failed on them. And it has to be a something called a, a multidisciplinary approach. So it can't be a single clinician that that makes that decision. Okay, so when you actually look at the hurdles that have to be leapt to prescribe this for a patient, they're they're very high, they're very onerous. And certainly my understanding in NHS practice is that very few patients have being prescribed these products. Mm. If you tie that in with the approach of the medical royal colleges, who it, by their very definition are, because they're responsible for the, the professional guidance for different specialties, will take a very balanced and measured view. And what they'll always go back to is the, the published evidence. So the Royal College of Physicians and the Royal College of Radiologists back in October last year published some recommendations and essentially said that in pain, there's very little evidence for the use of cannabis-based medical products. And they, although they did say in cancer pain, in, in special circumstances, there may be a role. But that ties in with the guidance from the Faculty of Pain Medicine, who again have said that there's very little evidence for their use. And they later came out and said that they didn't support the establishment of single specialty single drug clinics so the idea that you could set up a cannabis clinic mm. in the UK to treat pain they they do not support that because in the same way they wouldn't support an opioid clinic yeah imagine you know imagine if you set up a clinic and said all we're going to do is give you gabapentinoids in this clinic because pain requires a, um, a holistic approach you need to assess the whole biopsychosocial construct the faculty of pain medicine have published or publish really very high quality sta standards on pain medicine practice in the UK. And there's a very clear mechanism to assess patients and to develop a management plan. Mm. And if, you, if, you, if you're just treating pain with a single drug, you're very unlikely to make headway because you're not addressing the psychosocial issues of pain as well. So if I can develop that a yeah. bit more, cannabis isn't just a single drug though because of the sure. complexity of, yeah. of of it and and maybe this is a good point to clarify when we're talking about a cbmp mm -hmm. 
we talking generally about a strains of cannabis that have a more balanced cannabinoid profile in terms yeah. of THC and CBD? Because I think this is something that people, well, certainly people that, that don't understand cannabis or, or out of the, uh, not involved in the industry, is that, that all cannabis is, is the same as the street skunk yeah. that people sell, which has been bred to be extremely high in yeah. THC and very low in CBD. Yeah. The medical cannabis products that we're talking about have a have a decent amount of CBD in it as well. You're right. There's a huge amount of terminology bandied around. There are a huge number of different products. There are a huge number of different phytochemicals in a medical cannabis product. Although the 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 licensed products that you that are available from the large pharmaceutical companies like GW Pharma are very highly processed. The cannabis-based medical products that are produced in, for example, Canada or continental Europe are often either ingested as an oil or through a vaporizer, mm -hmm. and they contain a full spectrum of phytochemicals. The balance of those chemicals can be influenced both by the manufacturing and extraction process, but also by the strain of the cannabis plant, the conditions that the plant's grown in, and all of that has an influence obviously, on the, the downstream effect that that drug or drugs, as you say, or chemicals can have on, on a patient that's using those chemicals. And there are some famous examples from Israel, not in pain, but in pediatric epilepsy, where the strain of cannabis was changed. Even though the THC and the CBD ratios were the same, the other phytochemical profile was different, and the effectiveness of the drugs in pediatric epilepsy changed markedly overnight. Yeah. And that obviously has big clinical ramifications. And again, this just highlights why it's so important from a patient safety viewpoint that this, this industry is, is regulated, tested, that we understand it as well as we do to make sure that those kind of incidents don't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a huge responsibility to the medical profession in the UK and, and the pharmaceutical industry that we do take that mature and measured approach and that not only are we bringing products to, to the marketplace that are safe for our patients, and we, and we demonstrate that by running studies and, and collecting data, mm -hmm. but also we protect our patients from the need to acquire illicit street drugs, mm -hmm. which, as you alluded to, often have very high levels of THC. Yeah. And we know that THC is probably the predominant phytochemical that's responsible for a lot of the psychological harm that can happen if you if you consume lots of um, cannabis. Yeah. Again, we've talked so much we can talk about here. But another thing that we've talked about recently is the demonization of THC. And again, I'm not a scientist, but from yeah. my reading, it appears that THC is actually quite important, and particularly yeah, in, in pain yeah. medication. So yeah. it shouldn't be dismissed out of hand not because of this sort of product that's on the street, which has really given yeah. everything a really no, bad name. And I think. Um, you're right. I mean, THC interacts with the, the endocannabinoid system. CBD has has some interaction, but has effects on other signaling pathways. I think it's important, that ju just very briefly, that that we we mention the endocannabinoid system. Sure. It's a it's a very ancient signaling pathway in in the body. Basically, cells talk to each other all the time. They communicate by sending out transmitter molecules that act on receptors on cell bodies. So. The, the human body produces natural cannabis-like chemicals that then act on these receptors and have lots of very basic physiological effects, you know, regulating um, hunger, sleep, in inflammation, pain control. And this is the endocannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. So we've got these receptors on lots and lots of our cells. And this is what the the chemicals, the big headline chemicals in medical cannabis act on, so the THC, CBD. But also it's important to remember that in those medical cannabis products, there are lots and lots of other chemicals, which will also have effects on lots of other signaling systems, lots of other pathways that regulate lots of functions in the body. And we really don't understand that particularly well. And we don't understand how different blends, mixes, ratios, call it what you want, ha what effects they have. And this goes back to your point about personalized medicine, that actually the, the expression of different receptors varies from patient to patient. We're all different. This is why, you know, you said about your dad being allergic to one antibiotic and you're not. It's probably because you've got 
different receptor profiles on different cells. Exactly. Um, and that's genetics for you, right? It's, it's just a roll of the dice, mm. a lot of it. And, and this, again, means that we need to understand better why some patients respond very well to medical cannabis, some patients don't. Because then you're able to profile people, risk stratify them as far as side effects and as far as efficacy. So it's getting that targeted approach. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to research, isn't there? Mm. And, it, you know, in the can cannabinoids everyone talks about, but then yeah. you've got the terpenes, which sort of modulate the how yeah. the cannabinoids work yeah. and stuff. And again, I'm way out of my depth here in terms of scientific chat, yeah. but that's my understanding. So there's this kind of this concept of the entourage effect. There's a concept that cannabinoid receptors are interlinked with opioid receptors, so you can get effects, sort of cross-talk between these different systems. Part of the drive towards cannabis-based medical products, certainly in North America, has been the opioid crisis, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners will be um, familiar with. This idea that essentially due to the combination of a huge amount of unmet pain need, certain actions of, of certain pharmaceutical companies and, and medics They've created a kind of perfect storm of very aberrant opioid use in, in the States. And certainly there are publications now which show that adding in cannabis-based medical products can help you to, to dose reduce those opioids and move mm. patients off them. Um, and that's certainly driven a lot of the interest over in North America. We're not quite the same here in the UK, but we're certainly very aware as a specialty and as a medical establishment that opioid use um, needs to be monitored very closely and we need alternatives to mm. try and mitigate that risk in, in our patients. Yeah, the opioid crisis is very prevalent when you talk about medical cannabis yep. and it, it's interesting because the current system that we have is you know, less than perfect mm. where, where you have these unintended consequences, yep. you have a lot of side effects and it's almost... Cannabis seems to be battling stigma to has to be whiter than white in order to, to come out. And yeah. it's not like the system we have at the moment is perfect. Do you know yeah, what I mean? It's, and I, I've got a slide that I put up and, and it's basically a load of side effects. And I put it up and they're the kind of side effects that there, there was a big meta-analysis, a big study published last year looking at medical cannabis use in pain. And it essentially showed all these adverse events that patients experienced. And I put it up and, and the side effects, the adverse events of this drug are very similar to the ones that were mentioned in this paper. And actually, that drug is something called pregabalin, which is an, is an anti-neuropathic drug that's used very widely in the UK for nerve pain. And it's often associated with unpleasant side effects, and it's poorly tolerated by patients. And yet, as you said, medical cannabis has to almost jump a, a higher alternative threshold to some of these drugs that are very widely used both in secondary care pain but also in primary care in in general practice it's prescribed for a wide range of different of nerve pain conditions and it really is interesting to see the different view that, that the medical profession has to these two different agents i think if medical cannabis was called something else if you just <laughs> gave it a random <laughs> list of numbers and letters like a an investigatory drug product we wouldn't have half of these problems, basically. Absolutely. It's, it's really, it, it, it's very, very... Mostly frustrating. It doesn't frustrate me because I can understand why yeah. there is that reticence to, to engage with, with, with this process. And you've got to understand that this is being introduced into a, an NHS that's been, you know, under austerity measures for however many years, that it's a very strained system, resources are minimal, Everyone's working under a huge amount of pressure and actually trying to engage in that process. If, if you're, if you're, you know, struggling to keep your head above water professionally anyway, you're not you know, taking on something else is probably not your priority right now. Yeah, right? no, I get it. So, and it's, 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 there's some systemic hurdles on oh, yeah, there yeah, absolutely. And, and which have been kind of hard ingrained for, for many decades. Yeah. And actually if, to, to give the government credit. So for example, after they rescheduled it, something called the National Institute of Health Research, NIHR, released two big calls for research into cannabis-based medical products. They, they, they don't commonly do this, but they basically earmarked a big tranche of money for research and said, look, if you can come up with some sensible research proposals, 
it will get funded because we want to support this, the implementation of this um, medical product. And my understanding is that very, very few people applied because it's just so hard, as we talked about before, to develop meaningful research projects using cannabis-based medical products because they it, because it's so challenging mm -hmm. and because actually when you start scratching the surface of the research it raises more questions than um than you had at the start right you know how are we going to measure this what are we going to measure how are we going to deliver the drug what endpoints are we going to look at um, what are we, even, you know, what are we even, it's just it, Pandora's box. Yeah, man, it's, it is. <laughs> honestly, it's, um, it, it really is unlike any other kind of area I've been involved in um, during my career where you can define endpoints very tightly. And that's what you're always trying to do in clinical research to produce good quality studies. This is very different. And again, it, it's almost like we need to, before we even get into researching the medical product, cannabis-based medical product, we need to have, you know, a couple of years of almost like consensus work to try and come up with a, some kind of palatable and effective research paradigm that we could then deploy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the problem is that if you look at what a, a pharmaceutical or a drug company want to do, they're a business, they want to make money quickly, right? And actually having roundtable discussions about how we're going to do this doesn't make money. Mm. And it's having, it's finding players and participants in this field that are willing to do that, that is actually proving challenging. Because mm. when you look at what's actually happening, there are a few um, organisations that have, you know, jumped straight in with clinics and are kind of trying to get a toe in the door that way. And then a lot of the other big medical cannabis companies, you know, from Canada and Europe, have, you know, where are they? They're noticeable, but noticeable for their absence in the UK, aren't they? They're, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I did a show a few weeks ago talking about the pharmaceutical industry and Western yeah. medicine in general and the nature of funding for research yeah. often comes from pharma companies yeah. who have very, very deep pockets, but as you say, have a very clear goal yeah. at the end of the research. Yeah. And this is too sprawling and yeah. messy and hard to get your hands around yeah. that they're probably not willing to you know what's in it for them type thing absolutely um which is probably a big hurdle yeah. to initiating the research because it's not it's not cheap is it to do this sort of stuff it's, it's it's absolutely not cheap you're talking millions and millions of pounds to do high quality research and that research you've always got to remember you know it's blinded you've got no concept of what the endpoint potentially is going to be what the outcome is going to be. So it's a gamble, right? You're chucking millions of pounds into, you know, a black box that who knows what's going to come out the other side. But as you said, these, these organizations, these companies have very deep pockets. And I think what a lot of the guidelines and recommendations from the Royal Colleges have done is the balls come over the net and they very firmly hit the ball back into the, the, the drug companies side of the courts and said, right, if you want us to utilize these these products clinically you need to fund or assist in funding the research you know even simple things like having a registry of patients who are using cannabis based medical products like they have in israel where you can collect data mm. um nobody's funding that yeah. and you know the mhra so the medicines and healthcare regulatory authority have stated that they they desire one of these registries to be set up mm. but there, there's been no kind of no impetus or drive for that from either from the medical rural colleges or from the, the pharma companies. And again, that surprises me that that hasn't happened. I've, I've spoken to a couple of entrepreneurs who are looking at this. So maybe, maybe there's something there. Maybe, I need to, that's it. I mean, maybe it's the private sector that's going to kind of step it. in. I mean, the um, data, you know, the, the more data you can collect, the better. But then the problem with healthcare data is, is then, you know, with GDPR, mm -hmm. who owns the data, who gets access to the data. And before you know it, you end up with, you know, the Cambridge Analytica of, um, of medical cannabis. Yeah. And again, as you said before, medical cannabis has to have this, has to be whiter than white. You do not want a data scandal <laughs> to, to erupt off the back of medical cannabis. Yes. And I think that, the concept of big farmers' involvement in this is tempered by the opioid crisis, right? So 
the opioid crisis to a lot of people was driven by the behaviour of Big Pharma. And I think, again, a lot of the medical royal colleges and, and regulatory bodies are very mindful that medical cannabis can't be the same story, that mm. there must not be this perception or even the, the actions of, of Big Pharma pushing this 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 intervention yeah. drug. Yeah. Um, because, again, that isn't in patients' best interest. That isn't in the profession's best interest. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and some would argue that the advancement of medical cannabis is a direct threat to a very lucrative business in opioid-based medicine, which yeah. which is probably a, a whole new topic in itself. But yeah, I mean, if you look at, the, uh, I mean, if you are a company trying to produce a drug, pain is a really attractive market, right? Because it's so common, and also it's a chronic condition, so people live with pain for years and years and years, right? And if you can develop a drug that is effective and is tolerated you've then got a patient who is a consumer for many years mm. and this is this is a really interesting point about pain and medical cannabis that pretty recently so it was in august and um, the nice guidelines for the use of cannabis based medical products came out and what nice does essentially is a cost benefit analysis of a novel drug intervention looking at it through the kind of lens of the NHS and, you know, if this drug is brought to market and utilised on a population level, is it going to work out as being a cost effective intervention for the, for the NHS? And because pain is so common and because a lot of the studies conducted with cannabis based medical products are either of poor quality or of indeterminate benefit, if you put those two into the, the nice you know, churning machine mm -hmm. of algorithms and, and analysis, cannabis-based medical products in pain come out as a loser because they'd be used very widely potentially and their effectiveness is not proven. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a, the, the NICE guidelines essentially say do not use routine clinical practice um, cannabis-based medical products for pain, mm -hmm. which for a lot of clinicians um, probably is relatively reassuring because it means that when their patients come in and say, oh, doc, you know, my back, my back pain is still terrible. I'm taking all these medications. They, they'll, doctors will then will say, well, actually, the, the analysis has been done. We don't think this is, this is appropriate. What NICE do go on to say is that further research is required mm. in, in these following areas. And again, that ball's batted back into the court of, the, the pharmaceutical companies and the, the cannabis-based medical product companies to fund and support that research. Yeah. I think that's what's got to happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because there will be a lot of anecdotal evidence. I don't know what the latest numbers, but it's a million plus people who you know, are estimated to be using yeah. cannabis for not necessarily just pain, yeah. but for, for various medical ailments. That's quite a substantial amount of people which... Yeah. Who, who would argue it does provide yeah. me with some relief from X, Y, and Z symptoms. Well, this is, this is what makes cannabis-based medical products so different from other drugs or interventions, right? Because people are already sourcing it and self-medicating with it. Yeah. People don't go out and buy blood pressure tablets on the <laughs> street corner, do they? Yeah. Or um, buy a knee replacement in the garage. But medical cannabis, be, because medical cannabis has almost that folklore kind of recognition of, of the effects it has, you know, it relaxes people, it makes them want to eat, it makes them sleep, it helps with pain. And that goes back to, you know, the, the whole history of, of our country and society where it's been used for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years, plus the fact that people are using it. If, if it didn't work, people wouldn't be going out and buying it illicitly. Mm -hmm. People wouldn't be suggesting it to their friends, to their relatives. Um, and often you find that it's, it's people are sourcing it for their relatives, people they care about, and they see the effects it has. That's what makes it so different. This is what happened. So in Denmark, they, they've taken a slightly different approach in as much as their, their, their usage of cannabis-based medical products is much less tightly regulated because they said, look, this is a, this is a wholly different construct to other novel medicines. Mm. But what they've done is they've mandated very tight data collection, mm. same as Australia, same as Israel. Canada are trying to retrospectively introduce this. 
because getting that real world data, it's almost um, in, in a, with, with kind of normal drug development, after a drug comes to market, you have something called phase four or pharmacovigilance where data is collected on products that are brought to market mm. for adverse events. And that, that's in essence what that approach has been, that you're, you're putting a drug out into the market and then you're, you're doing real world data collection. And yeah, I think that may well be a solution to some of the issues that we that we have, and maybe alter the sort of paradigm of how these things are evaluated yeah. potentially, because that seems to be a big hurdle. Uh, well, I, I chaired a panel of medical cannabis patients back mm. in August, and one of the girls on the panel was quite young, I think she was twenty, but it had a, a quite a bad condition for for most of her life, and hadn't really eaten for yep. three years. And she turned eighteen. Her consultant said off the record said you're 18 now i can't stop you if you happen to get some cannabis yeah. that might help you and she went in and got some and she said and this i think is is also commonly misunderstood i asked her about you know do, do you feel any high from it and she was like no you don't i'm in such bad pain or yeah. my, my condition is so bad that this actually just made me feel human again yeah. i was able to function and so the, the high or whatever people smoking yeah. or, or, or taking it recreationally it, it's not even a consideration because it's actually just put her on a level playing field again yeah. which is a really it's a very hard concept to to grasp in terms of how medicines are evaluated i suppose yeah and i, I think that you know a high in inverted commas with a drug is not just related to the chemicals in the drug, it's related to the pharmacokinetics. So the way that that drug is absorbed into the body, the levels in the bloodstream, the peak, the rate at which that increases. This, this is why, you know, people, heroin addicts don't eat heroin, right? They inject it or they smoke it because then it's rapidly absorbed into the body. And if you're eating or taking a medical cannabis substance orally, the rate at which that drug is ingested into the body is very slow. The, the, the counter to that is that then if you're going to get side effects, they might last longer. Mm. Whereas if you vaporize it, it's a very rapid intake across the, the mucous membranes and, you know, mouth, nose, lungs, and you get a rapid peak, but it wears off rapidly. Mm. So again, this is one, one of the issues with cannabis-based medical products that actually it, it's trying to get some kind of uniformity of product to understand it better because at the moment it's a huge basket of different things that are all called the same thing right mm -hmm. and again for a lot of clinicians who aren't familiar with this for a lot of patients who aren't familiar with this for a lot of the media and a lot of interested parties understanding these basics is really important before you start making decisions or start making commentary on on this this whole um this whole area yeah and I think, again, part of the responsibility of clinicians and, and scientists who understand this is to educate and inform and keep the conversation about this very, very calm, rational and measured. Because I don't, you know, medical cannabis is not a silver bullet that's going to cure everything. I think it will it will have a place to play in a integrated, holistic and very sensible approach to pain medicine alongside all the other treatments that we deploy yeah. it's not going to solve the opioid crisis it's not going to cure pain but what it might do is improve quality of life for some of our patients it will certainly improve patient safety because people won't be needing to source illicit cannabis that you don't know what's in it and i think that it will change the way that we we practice pain medicine but i don't think it's a silver bullet yeah, I, I totally agree. And I am a very big proponent of that balanced view. Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of people very passionate about fighting the cause to change people's opinions on cannabis yeah. and almost sort of do see it as a, a panacea or, or this thing that can do no wrong. Yeah. And, and like everything in life, there's, there's, there isn't anything that, you know, you can, yeah. you can die from drinking too much water. <laughs> exactly. you can, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all crazy yeah. stuff like that. So there is a balance that is needed. And so it's great to hear your opinion on that. I guess we're, we're getting towards the end of the show, but have you got any views on the future in terms of where this might go? And I, I mean, <laughs> it's, crystal yeah, balls yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think, I think one of the, the most fascinating things about this area is that, it's very hard to make predictions. You know, if you if you dial back five years, no one had thought that there'd, there would have been this kind of, this huge shift in the way in which we're engaging with this this entity. 
I think that my my predictions are all going to be very captain sensible. I think that there's there's going to be more research. I think that the discussions about how we do that high quality research will continue. I think that certainly colleagues and um, associates I know across the country are very inter interested in doing high quality research, interested in exploring this this area with a very, very close eye on the fact that this is driven by benefiting our patients, patient safety and understanding this this fascinating area more. And that's probably as far as I'd go to be honest. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Good to be cautious in your predictions. Yeah. I mean, I just had a thought through where we were talking about, is there a potential, and God knows when this might happen, where, where you're starting to mix some of the constituent parts of opioid-based drugs with some of the constituent parts of cannabis and coming up with a concoction there that addresses well, pain? I, mean, I, mean, I don't know yeah. about, enough about it. We, I mean, one of the things we do anyway is this, we call it a multimodal approach. So the idea that if you use different analgesic drugs that work on different pathways, they often have a um, synergistic effect so that the, the added, added effect is bigger than the sum of their parts, but also it means you can use lower doses so you get less side effects. Mm. So you'd kind of think that actually if you saw a patient who was already on opioids and a gabapentinoid, maybe something else, adding in a bit of medical cannabis might actually enable you to dose reduce the other meds it might mean that their functional levels improve. It might mean they get less side effects associated with the other agents. Yeah. And to me, that's kind of where medical cannabis would sit. Yeah. Um, again, in relation to pain. In relation to pain. And again, it, it's kind of captain sensible, right? <laughs> and it sits there in a, in a proper assessment, examination, investigations, explanation, alongside things like physio, rehab, all of those things. Yeah. And actually, that's how you get a good outcome for your patients. Yeah. A truly holistic approach yeah, to absolutely. it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, Matt, that's been brilliant. I, I need to ask you my customary last question, which is, what did your parents say when you told them you were going to be studying? Um, it, it, that's a really good question. I think that actually when you, when you explain what cannabis-based medical products are and you explain how big the unmet need is in your patients, when you explain what your ambitions and your aims are, which are all very realistic, very measured, and very sensible, um, they have absolutely no problems whatsoever. To me, it's, a, it's something that you know, we should be doing as clinicians in a responsible way. Mm. Fantastic. I mean, look, yeah, when, when you've got esteemed people like yourself who are getting involved, I think it is a real signifier of, yeah. of, of where this has come and where it is and where it's going, basically. Cool. Well, thank you, Matt. It's no, been pleasure. really, really thank enjoyable. You. We could have talked for a lot longer. Yeah, no, but, no, no, we could. Um, we probably bored you off to sleep. No, no, no. It's been brilliant. <laughs> thank you very much. Right, pleasure. Cheers.